Yeah, it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, you know, being influential and in modeling is, is important for all of our leaders. And whether you're at a senior grade or a junior grade, you're somebody's uh, supervisor. And that makes an impression upon people, especially when you do it in a thoughtful and caring way. Welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast of Army Management Staff College. Leader Up is a professional conversation where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army civilian professional. I'm your host, David Howie. Hey, Leader Up audience, on today's episode, we've got an absolutely fabulous guest. I am so happy and honored to have in our studio today, Major General David Doyle. And General Doyle is the commander of Fort Carson, Colorado, and the 4th Infantry Division. And so, General Doyle, I just want to thank you for giving up your time and coming in today to be a a guest on Leader Up. Oh, that's fantastic. It's good to be back with your team. I think we did this uh, not too long ago and had a chance to talk uh, when I was at uh, then Fort Polk, now Fort Johnson. So it's wonderful to be here with you today. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to first talk about the role of Army civilians and just thinking back on your career, how you've seen the role of Army civilians change during that time frame. Well, the the importance of the Army civilian has never changed. In fact, what I would submit is as we've become a little bit more of a lean force and we've dealt with uh, resource scarcity in our uniform military the continuity and the consistency of our Army civilians becomes even more crucial. Over 30 years, you know, the Army's force structure has changed, gone up, gone down. And what I've witnessed is when we have the right Army civilians in the right positions, we're able to manage systems properly. We're managing resources properly. And then what we also do is ensure that the organization is focused. Um, Sometimes the individual commanders who arrive on the scene uh, want to try different things, and that's great. It's always useful to have creative thought and innovative ideas. But the focus on actual mission accomplishment with experience is often vested in some of our uh, Army civilians who stay through transitions and see uh, the growth and development of organizations. So that's, that's what I've witnessed over 30 years. And I think you're right that the the right balance is when we have the that stability and continuity that civilians provide with kind of that, hey, here's some new ideas. Here's the broadening things that I've seen after going around the army for years and years. And when when that relationship is done well, when it's when there's the right mixture, it's it's extremely powerful. David, you're exactly right. And that requires some dialogue and engagement. It requires consistent interaction. And hopefully we'll talk a little bit about the methods that we use to to keep our workforce informed and allow them to understand that which is a you know necessary change versus the things that are probably not worth the squeeze when you go through you know the adjustments. I watched a couple of my uh, DA civilians, the the folks that I trusted the most, engage with me and say, "Hey, let me just tell you some history on things that have happened." So you can make an informed decision. And because we had a good collaborative uh, engagement plan and it was consistent and iterative, I was able to take some of that uh, experience and I wouldn't say temper, but adjust the the modifications I wanted to make to our organization. An extremely important point is that you, you're attempting to create a climate where the civilians feel like they can come in and say, hey, let's think about this part of it. And that, that makes the decision even better when, when there's that kind of a dialogue. Oh, you're right. Uh, we, you know, in the fielded force have gone through a couple evolutions. And during the period of deployments to Afghanistan and Iraq, we established the mission support element. And our, our, our DA civilians were basically the continuity that kept an installation running while the proponents of the leadership were forward deployed. And that model worked extremely well. And we were able to kind of harvest experience from retired military personnel or personnel who were highly trained professionals that could keep a base from, you know, collapsing on its own mass. We then uh, took away, at least in the force comm realm, we took away that uh, mission support element and we did a full staff integration where the Department of the Army civilians started working with 
the uniform staff, at least at the division level and somewhat at the installation level. And so that change was pretty substantial because you no longer were worried about having a standalone capability. You were worried about how do I make all of this work together in a cohesive form? And I think that's the model most of our, uh, at least the, the divisions in Forcecom are, are using right now. Uh, but there's always this thought that we may get called to take an entire installation's worth of leaders and go elsewhere. And it's unlikely you know, that a garrison team is going to be able to run everything in support of a division or a core headquarters. So we're reconsidering you know, the different models. And again, going back to those people who were there, who witnessed it, you, you can learn. You can absolutely appreciate uh, their experience. But it does take dialogue. It does take interaction. It does take formalized sessions for um, in, engagement. And the, what you just said probably answers my next question, but I'm going to pose it and maybe you have other ideas, but it's about the importance of Army civilians completing their professional education. So we, that, and that's what we do at Army Management Staff College. We do the different courses that are about leadership at the different levels for Army civilians. So why is that important? And, and given all of the things that you, you just talked about, alignment, communication, dialogue. Why is it important in that light for Army civilians to complete their professional education? Well, the, the way that the civilian professional education program is designed is not only does it equip them for management requirements and additional responsibility, it brings them into a more current understanding of what the Army is doing. And sometimes when you get into a, a mode where you've been very familiar with your problem set, your set of requirements, your role, uh, you don't have the opportunity to see the broader picture. And, and I think that's what the education program is really good at right now is opening up the army level uh, issues or army level topics of discussion and introducing that into the curriculum. And then your department of the army civilians can see where they fit in the the system, but also see what the army's working towards. What is, what is the manner in which the army is trying to evolve? And then they can make great judgments on how to help that out. And so if, if I'm a, a civilian toiling away at a depot somewhere and I come here to army management staff college and go through the advanced course and I hear from senior leaders intent kind of statements, this is what we're trying to accomplish then it, it helps me when I go back and I'm in my cubicle doing a job to see how what I'm doing fits into the big picture. It does. It gives a little bit more sense of purpose. My estimation is you understand how you're connected. It understands what the priorities are, those things that matter the most versus those things are maybe less important for you know urgent accomplishment. And then lastly, it lets people see that they're part of a big team and I think the Rolodex building that you get at a professional military education course is almost as valuable as the education experience itself. You sit with and talk to or engage virtually with those members of other organizations and you start identifying those people who can help you help your organization or just be, you know, reliable sounding boards. So in, in any professional military education opportunity, you have that uh, the chance to become more connected to the the rest of the force. And so I'd like to switch gears and talk a little bit about some leadership and leader development topics, but I want to start with a little bit more about your role as the commander of the 4th Infantry Division. And there, there's a phrase that I've seen in the preparation for this, it's the Ivy methodology. And what is that? What does that mean? We have a principle about how we interact with one another. I mean, it's kind of like a strategic approach or a governing set of tenants. And regardless of what job you have, what you know, mission you're supporting, it's pretty simple. And the Ivy methodology is number one, we're going to invest in our people. We're going to send them to professional military education. We're going to make sure they're trained. We're going to make sure they have the right equipment, the right office supplies, the right material support. So investing in our people is really important. But the term investment matters because we make an investment because we expect a return. So when we contribute to somebody's professional well-being or development, there's a correlating expectation that they're going to make the organization better, whether it's in the short term at, at Fort Carson or whether they go to someplace else or whether they get out of the Department of the Army civilian system and they're better citizens for the United States. So that investment is done for purpose. 
The second thing we do, uh, we say we're going to accomplish our mission. And that's a commitment we all have to make to one another that regardless whether it's difficult or challenging or resource intensive, if we have a mission to accomplish to help the Army be ready to fight and win, we're going to do the right work. And so that's a degree of commitment. It's kind of the commitment lane of focus. The third thing, and I get a little bit of grief for this, we say we take care of our stuff. And people are like, hey, didn't Doyle, didn't you go to school? I mean, stuff, is that the word you're going to use? Yes, it's the word I'm going to use. We take care of our stuff because that could be equipment, it could be infrastructure, it could be weapon systems, it could be our office, it could be you know responsibility for our stewardship. Uh, but it's not just in a very discreet, you know, temporal frame. We say we're going to take care of our stuff because we're making an investment for the people that come behind us. There will be people who run Fort Carson after I'm gone. And if I have not improved the foxhole, if I've not made things better for them, then I have neglected my responsibility. And so that's the commitment I want all of our team to make is take care of your stuff. Take care of your stuff because it's what we have and it's going to have to be useful for the team that follows behind you. Uh, and, and I think that's a obligation we have to make the Army better. And then the fourth element of the Ivy methodology is we exercise creativity and innovation. We look for new ideas. We seek information from our subordinates. We talk to people who are bumping up against problems and say, hey, what is it that you think we could do better? How can we inform ourselves so we don't keep doing the same thing over and over again if it's not producing the right results? And we do that with feedback mechanisms and surveys, and we have a Ivy Human Capital campaign that engages with people to get their input. So those four things, you know, the investing in our people, accomplishing our mission, taking care of our stuff, and exercising creativity and innovation are what we're trying to do at Fort Carson. I'd like to talk about a topic that I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about this, and I just want to get your thoughts about it, and it's climate mm. in an organization. And, you know, we used to delineate, you have climate uh, as opposed to culture, culture being maybe more enduring, climate being maybe a little more short, short term. What is climate and what, what kind of things do you look for as, as a division commander to kind of gauge the climate in my organization? Yeah, I like the way you describe that. Climate is often conditions-based. Um, we When you find different leaders or different um, situations, your climate can evolve and change. But it, in the best organizations, it's linked to a very strong culture. And culture is hard to change. Culture is usually baked into an organization. And, and if you're going to make adjustments on that, you have to make sizable commitments. And so we're first working on our culture at the 4th Infantry Division. We want the identity, the purpose, the sense of belonging, and then the willingness to you know, take care of one another to be the driver, uh, basically the bedrock um, for our organization. But the climate matters too, because that's the stuff that people see on a more uh, frequent basis. The The culture is you know, the foundation and the climate is, you know, kind of the, the first floor, if you will, of the house. And so what we're trying to do with our climate is ensure people are, a, are revered and respected and appreciated. And so the input that they have in decision making and the way that they can interact matters. We did a, a town hall with all of our Department of the Army civilians, and we were able to ask them, hey, what do you see is going well and what do you see that we need to change with our climate? And we got some great feedback on some of the things that they needed to do their job more effectively to feel like they were valued. And so I, I think we have to make continuous effort on climate, but it, it can be dynamic. Um, and, and I still think if you're going to have an effective organization, not only does the climate need to be good, but the culture has to be well understood and appreciated. And so let's, let's say that I'm a, I'm a young uh, captain or major I'm I'm just coming out of one of my professional education courses going into command. What kind of advice would you have for that officer going into command, a significant gate in their career, to focus on climate? What kind of advice would you give that person to have, let's say, a positive effect on, on a unit's climate? Yeah, Dave, that's great. I wish I'd had somebody coach me on this when I was a young captain. Um what I what I wish that I had done differently was seek more sources of information about the climate because you have an ability to see certain things. You, you have a observed reality. You can look around and take notes on how people are interacting when you're there 
you have a, an appreciation for how people react to you. Uh, and then obviously I think you get some information from the chain of command because normal reporting happens. And then you may have a few other sources that'll confide in you or let you know things that are going on. But the more you broaden that, the more you expand that, the more you seek information from maybe non-traditional sources, the more comprehensive your view of reality is going to be. And uh, there was a very old article. um, Actually, it was a memorandum written by then Lieutenant Colonel Pentecost. And it was called The Efficacy of the Ranger Battalion. And it had a lot of things that were very specific just to the Ranger Regiment, but it had one thing that was useful for me and I think a lot of other folks who are in leadership positions. He talked about sources of information. He said, you have to, if you understand your climate, you understand your organization, you understand what really is happening within your unit, you have to be willing to listen to a variety of different sources. And you have to listen to what your families are saying. You have to listen to what your privates and your junior personnel are saying. You have to find ways of connecting with your peers to understand what they think about your organization. Certainly you want to hear from the chain of command, your non-commissioned officers, but the broader your base of information is, the more likely you are to make better decisions because you're going to have a much more holistic view of, uh, of your unit. And I'm just telling you, that's hard to do for our junior leaders because they have so many requirements that they think they have to get done. And it, and it's just a, a worthwhile endeavor to, to broaden that, effort, see what's going on, and then make decisions based on that more complete picture. When I was a younger officer, I always felt like there was a a they out there that were making the decisions. And I think, and there's an inflection point in most officers' careers when they realize, okay, I am now the they that I used to talk about. There's this idea that there's this big organization out there in the army that makes all the decisions. And then you realize when you get to a certain point, no, there's, it's not like some huge conglomerate that's decide it's me. And, and if I don't like the way things are going, I've got to interject myself and raise my hand and be willing to stand up and be counted. I think that, uh, it is difficult to speak up when you're younger, but also I will ask you, do you, have you found as you've increased in rank, that the gulf, it feels like it's widening, that your your rank pulls you away from being able to, for pe- people being candid with you. Have you felt that? Have you sensed that? Yeah, that's a huge challenge, um, both from just being busy and trying to do a lot of different things to help the organization. And, and you get this phenomenon where you're, you know, an inch deep and a mile wide. So the opportunities you have are reduced but the intensity is sometimes reduced. You know, the willingness to set aside time to really listen to somebody, to gain an appreciation for what they have to say. And what I find is if I make that time, if I'm disciplined in counseling and I afford those who are within the chain of command a chance to kind of give me their thoughts and observations, the, the more you engender trust, the more you have these conversations, the more frequent they happen, the, the more candid they become. And so, it's, it's, again, it's a worthwhile effort to program time for counseling. And I, I am not a higher level reviewer for a lot of different civilians. And yet I find myself in their office a lot just to talk, just to listen, just to give them a chance to tell me what's going on. I walk down the hall and find my, my G8 team, the resource managers, and they're mostly civilians and they get a chance to tell me what they see. And when I do that, I find that you know, the first conversations are about the weather and about the Seahawks or the Broncos or, you know, we're talking about football. But the more frequently I do it, the more they're willing to bring things to my attention that they want me to know about because I think it's important. And so I have to continue to remind myself that that matters um, regardless of rank. And I encourage my subordinates to do that as well. And it's not just with our civilian workforce, it's, it's with anybody in the organization. I'd like to talk about leader development and the the premium that you have put on leader development through your career. I've always believed that when an officer is in charge of an organization, one of their most important functions is to develop the subordinate leaders in that organization. How would we draw a connection between leader development and let's say something like mission accomplishment uh, and lethality, if we want to talk about that? 
what because we often think I'm doing leader development at the cost of the mission or I'm accomplishing the mission at the cost of leader development and those things are not are not mutually exclusive so how are they related how do you see the connection between those two yeah you're you're 100 correct they are codependent so to speak uh general rainey when he was a uh, division commander you know I had the opportunity to share with a group of us and explain that if you care about the army and the future of the army the number one thing that you will do in leadership positions is develop your subordinates and give them the opportunity to learn from your experience and to study things that matter in an educational domain, educational frame. Because he said, that's those people that you're dealing with are the future of the army. They're taking your position in the not too distant future. They're going to have incredible responsibility and you want them to be equipped and prepared to do the best job possible. So I took that guidance and really felt uh, obligation and commitment to put it into action. And so as a brigade commander, I developed a, a, we call it the arc system where we looked at different topics and we segmented them because it's one thing to learn about a topic. It's another thing to kind of coalesce those ideas and put them into practice so that it's energy that goes into the system and not just you know, intellectual thought. And so the first segment of a, a four segment arc would be to study the doctrine. What's authoritative out there? What's kind of approved for consumption. And the you know, doctrine gives us that in many cases for army topics. The second segment of the arc is designed to see what other people are doing. What is academia doing? What, what do business people do with it? What's out there that doesn't necessarily have a military nexus. The third segment of the arc is how does it apply to us, bringing it back into you know the military construct, the unit. And then the fourth segment is what are we going to do to implement it? What policies, procedures, or things are we going to execute now that we've learned about this? So that ARC model uh, really helped me ensure we had alignment and focus for our leaders. So they weren't just picking things out of the blue to study, but they were working on it in a cohesive way. So we at, at the 4th Infantry Division have established three different ARCs. And the first ARC is dealing with culture. And I talked to you about, I think that's important. The second arc is on, on how we think with innovation, trying to make sure we're not rigid or stuck in old ways. We're going to do a lot of work with data and, and some things that might be new to folks in the military. But then the third arc is lethality. How do we put all this together? Our culture, our innovation to produce effects on the battlefield. And I think that's the way you make sure that the two interact is you focus on things that will make your leaders better in the future. You focus on things that they have to deal with in the now, and then you make sure that it's consistent with what your organization's purpose is. So that's what we're trying to do. And I think uh, I've gotten great feedback from our team on adjustments and ways to make it a little bit more effective. Um, and we're going to continue with that methodology. I'd like to talk to you, sir, about uh, a publication that the Center for Army Leadership published in February of 2024. And the name of the publication is providing feedback through coaching, counseling, and mentoring. And I want to talk a little bit about those three topics, but just maybe broadly, the importance of feedback for you to get feedback and to offer feedback. What, how have you seen that to be important in your role as a division commander? Yeah, I think that's the most important thing I do as a division commander. In, in any command echelon, if you're not receiving feedback and giving feedback, you're operating on an island, you're completely isolated. So my target audience at the 4th Infantry Division are my battalion commanders, two levels below. Those are the folks that can shape company battery troop commanders. They can help the lives of our soldiers. And I need to make sure that I have consistent and regular opportunities to work with them. So I have this uh, outreach program and it's bedrock is counseling, deliberate performance counseling, deliberate initial counseling, deliberate evaluation counseling. And we put that on my calendar and I am absolutely committed to doing that because that's the way 622 tech one says you're supposed to professionalize the force is let them know when they're doing well, let them know what they need to improve upon and then give them the opportunity to give you uh, their observations. So that's the, the bedrock principle, but we're doing a lot of, I think unique stuff. I don't know if it's unique. I've, I've stolen some of it from other leaders. I run a shadow program where I pull two battalion commanders on two days and they do everything that I do. If 
from PT all the way to dinner at my house. They follow me throughout the day. And after each event, we talk. We say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you le- learn from that? How, how can I do this better? And it's just a really immersive experience. They get to see the division level stuff and I get to hear from them on what it really translates to down at their level. Um, we run a right arm night. We bring battalion commanders and their sergeants major together. We have a social event once a month where we can just let our hair down and kind of experience a social setting and talk to people because you learn so much about their lives when you're in that. We do a, a program where uh, I bring them for PT. They do physical training with me. I see them at retirement ceremonies. We are on a pretty strong retention push. So I've interacted with them in different four there. So each one of these things gives me a chance to see them, talk to them, interact with them, and you know build this iterative relationship where they do hear from me and I do hear from them. And it's got to be concrete and programmed. If it just happens through normal meetings or normal happenstance, it's not very effective. And what I find when I go out to training and I'm talking to these people, I can talk to them about their families or I can talk to them about the, their unit. I, I have a much broader array of topics to draw upon to get them to understand what needs to be done or to give them some constructive um, ways of improving their, their performance. And that shadowing program, that's kind of about coaching and mentoring at the same time. Definitely. It's, it's a modeling opportunity uh, because I'm not any different. Uh, when they're there than when I'm not there. And they get to see how I interact with different stressors or situations. Uh, if, if bad news comes in, they're sitting right there at the desk, you know, listening to me deal with it. And so I think that's important because they can then decide, does that model translate with how I need to lead my formation? Is that the way I'm going to react when things happen? So that is a form of coaching through modeling. I'd like to t- take a little uh, sidestep. Sure. You mentioned something about when you get bad news, and I just want to want, want to hear a little bit more of your thoughts about that. I used to work in Army Public Affairs, and we used to have a, uh, an idea when we talked about crisis management that when an organization feels most like they want to close up and say nothing, that's probably an indicator that you need to open up and be more accessible to the public. When there's bad news, how do you handle it? And why is it important for for your your philosophy about dealing with bad news? Why is that important? And and how have you seen it uh, be effective over the years? What I try to communicate to my team is we've got to be precise and we've got to be timely. And timely doesn't always mean fast, but timely means appropriate. Um, And so when we're working through the receipt of information, we have to make sure that we have credibility that it's accurate before we release it. Because you know the deal, if, if you release information that's wrong and have to reframe it, you lose a little bit of credibility and then potentially folks don't want to hear the second story. Right. They, they get locked on the first. But I think with bad news, you have to appreciate the context and understand what your higher level needs to know about it so that then you can work together to say, hey, this is what we're going to share. and this is how we're going to share it. And the vehicle matters, the delivery mechanism matters. And, and I really do believe the more that you do this, and, and you're right, you be, if you're transparent with you know, different individuals who are in the receipt of the information, they start understanding you're not going to hide things. And they have trust and confidence that when you tell them things, it's accurate. Uh, so that's the balance that we have to make timely and, and accurate or precise. And sometimes, you know, the enemy of, you know, good enough, I mean, perfect. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> we, we can't always get it perfect, but we have to let some of the information go as we then try to clarify or reevaluate what we received. So I think you're right. Um, turning into a turtle and trying to hide all of those things never works out well. You have to be willing to let folks know that you've got a situation or a problem and you're going to work through it. And as you get more information, you're going to let them know. I'd like to talk specifically about mentoring and some of the successful mentoring techniques or things that you've seen over the years, ways that mentoring has happened. You mentioned that shadowing program that, that you have. Have you seen other, uh, other things like that or just vignettes or things that you can think of over the years that helped you understand mentoring a little bit better? 
And that's a really important topic in a lot of different viewpoints on what mentoring is and is not. My thoughts are it's a consistent interaction over time um, and helping folks with, you know, the decisions they have to make as they progress through the military based on your experience. And mentoring isn't, isn't the same as coaching. It's not the same as counseling. It's generally, you know, my understanding of the reading is it's done over a prolonged period of time because you develop a, a relationship, a trust relationship. So I guess a good example of mentorship, uh, one of my mentors was a retired, well is retired uh, General David M. Rodriguez. He was my first battalion commander, my first brigade commander. Uh, we worked together throughout a different deployment opportunities. And what I found was his perspective on leadership was one that I wanted to model. I wanted to be like him. And so I asked a lot of questions about how he reacted to circumstances, the things that he did when he was confronted with challenges, and also just decisions on career progression. You know, I'd ask him what he thought about this option versus that option. And because we had formed that relationship previously, before because we had worked together in a couple different settings, he was able to understand what I was going through and therefore give me some useful information. So I think if you're going to mentor somebody, it's it's got to be fairly in depth if you're going to be value added. Otherwise, you're just uh, you're providing some generic feedback. Uh, so that that's the number one thing I think is important in mentoring is having a close relationship between the mentor and mentee. And I think the second thing about mentoring is it, if it's done well, it should be, you know, throughout the career it should, you know, whenever it starts, it should continue on. He's still my mentor. He's been retired for quite, quite some time. And yet he, he provides me a lot of good thoughtful feedback when I ask him different questions. It's, it's not always completely necessary, but it's helpful when someone is mentoring you that has gone through the exact same thing, either the same job, or, or in some way, they've gone through what you have gone through. I think it's helpful, but I, got, I agree. It's not necessary. Uh, I do a lot of mentoring with folks in different career fields, and I have to be honest with them and, and tell them, hey, I don't know all the different aspects that you're dealing with, but let me do some research. Let me ask some questions. And here are some people that you can talk to that have experienced that. So um, that's one of the things about becoming more senior is you have just a good Rolodex that you can rely upon to point out uh, opportunities for engagement. And that that's important in mentoring. It's not necessarily just increasing the capacity for the individual to make their own decisions. It's giving them different sources to hear from. And sometimes we mentor people. I don't know if you've, if you've ever experienced this and we don't know it. So, somebody will come back later and say, you know, I work for you here, there. I watched you all the time. Uh, I, I was so impressed with how you led that unit. And you barely talked to them when you were there and, and you come back and find out what a, a, a huge impact you had on their lives and their career. Yeah, it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, you know, being influential and in modeling is, is important for all of our leaders. And whether you're at a senior grade or a junior grade, you're somebody's uh, supervisor. And that makes an impression upon people, especially when you do it in a thoughtful and caring way. And the final thing that I'd like to talk to you about today, sir, is some recommended professional reading that you would offer to our leader up audience. Yeah. Uh, you know, from a, a broad military standpoint, um, I find that there are very few classic iconic books that are better than T.R. Fehrenbach's This Kind of War. He, he calls it a model or uh, study in preparedness. And he talks about why we have an army and he wrote it in the beginning of the Vietnam conflict, the Vietnam War, but it references the Korean War. And he talks about the war, the army that we had in World War II and why it was unable and ill-prepared to fight the war in Korea. And he cites both social and uh, institutional changes and dynamics that happened in that very short period between 1945 and 1950. And I don't know that each one of them correlates exactly to what we're dealing with today, but there are many themes and concepts that resonate. And so I ask all of our military professionals to, to read through that to make sure that we're doing the right thing. I mean, the United States of America requires us to be prepared. The United States of America, the government of the U.S., the people of the United States need an army that can go 
defend our way of life and optimally deter warfare, but be ready to go and, and actually conduct warfare. The Chief of Staff of the Army's number one priority is war fighting. So if you read that book, it gives you a little bit of a impetus to make sure that you're dialed in, that you're prepared, that you're straight. So I think that's a, that's a good text. And again, I consider it a classic. Another book that uh, I've had folks read came from my Sam's experience, and it's called The Logic of Failure by Dietrich Dorner. And that book describes how when people have catastrophic events or organizations have catastrophic events, they rarely strike like a bolt out of the blue. That's his thesis, that there are things that are baked into a process or a system or a manner of doing business that lead to the failure. And sometimes folks just ignore it willfully or unwittingly. And he cites uh, the Chernobyl uh, reactor example and the, and the Challenger event as examples of that. I think the third book, you know, I would commend to people, you know, as you're starting to look through, you know, professional military reading, um, we, we've done a couple of different iterations on this and it's uh, Cotter's book on leading change. And that's a, you know, it's a business oriented book, but I think it has applicability on how do you get an organization to get fired up about doing something that might be different, might be unique, might be uncomfortable. And uh, those are, uh, I think, common lessons that all of our personnel need to know, whether you're a Department of the Army civilian, a leader at a higher level, or you're just trying to get a, a small unit to do something that maybe they're unaccustomed to. So it's a good book. It's a short read. It's got great examples, and it's uh, it's pretty helpful. Major General David Doyle, I want to thank you so much for giving up your time today to be a guest on Leader Up and engaging with our Leader Up audience out there. Thank you so much. Maybe we'll get you back a- another time in the future. Well, that would be fantastic. I love coming through this installation. It's the capstone centerpiece of the United States Army's intellectual effort. And what you're doing here makes a big difference. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. So Leader Up audience, what did you hear today from General Doyle? What did he say that kind of resonates with you about climate, about the Ivy methodology, about feedback, about mentoring, any of those topics? Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube page and join us again next time for another edition of Leader Up. As always, if you have any questions or feedback or would like to learn more about our podcast, please check the description for our email and for our website. Thanks for listening.